A reading from the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew. Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 through 46. Jesus said to his disciples, When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate them one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep at his right hand, but the goats at his left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, O blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see thee hungry, and feed thee, or thirsty, and give thee drink? And when did we see thee a stranger, and welcome thee, or naked, and clothe thee? And when did we see thee sick, or in prison, and visit thee? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these my brethren, you did it to me. Then he will say to those at his left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me, naked, and you did not clothe me, sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, Lord, when did we see thee hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister to thee? Then he will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it not to one of the least of these, you did it not to me. And they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Well, my friends, we bring this liturgical year to a close on this final Sunday, this great solemnity of our Lord Jesus Christ, King of the Universe, otherwise referred to as the Feast of Christ the King. We have been surveying over the last several episodes key passages taken from this 25th chapter of the Gospel according to St. Matthew. As I pointed out in our last episode, this final major discourse recorded in the Gospel of Matthew is known as the Olivet Discourse, a highly eschatological discourse pointing forward to the end of the age, pointing forward to the second coming of our blessed Lord. And in the midst of this exhortation, our Lord is summoning his disciples to be vigilant, to be watchful, to be prepared for the return of the Lord, the Son of Man. And here in this final parable, this parable speaks to us of that final judgment that will accompany the return of the Son of Man. And I want to survey this passage along with you and, and hopefully highlight certain elements that hopefully will edify you as you reflect upon God's Word, as you prepare for the upcoming liturgy for this great solemnity. So why don't we begin with the very first verse. Our Lord here employs one of his most favorite titles, a messianic title that he frequently applies to himself. That title is that of Son of Man. In verse 31 of our gospel, we read as follows, and I quote, When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Close quote. Jesus here once again employs this messianic title. He refers to himself as Son of Man. Now, this is a callback to a passage taken from Daniel chapter 7. This is a passage that I've referred to on numerous occasions. Here in Daniel chapter 7, the prophet speaks of this vision that he received of one like a Son of Man. Now, the Son of Man referred to in Daniel chapter 7, this passage, differs from, for example, in the book of the prophet Ezekiel, another prophetic book that employs, much like Daniel, apocalyptic language and imagery. 
in the book of the prophet Ezekiel, when the Lord refers to son of man, he is most often referring to the prophet. He is calling him son of man. And he does this in speaking of several of these figures, these prophets. But here in Daniel chapter 7, this occasion is different. The prophet is not speaking of himself. He's not speaking of a fellow prophet. But no, this son of man is different. If you turn with me to Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, beginning of verse 13, we read as follows, and I quote, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. Let's stop there. So here the prophet receives a vision of one coming in the clouds, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. Now, clearly, this is no ordinary human being. And he came, the text continues, he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and kingdom that all people's nations and languages should serve him. Let's stop there. And so this is a figure, a divine figure, one like a son of man, one with the countenance of a human being, but yet divine for he was coming in the clouds. He appeared before the ancient of days who was sitting on a throne. That is a reference to it could be interpreted as a figure of God, the father. And so he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him and to him, that is to this son of man, to him was given dominion and glory and kingdom. So this is speaking of a son of man who is also a king who has given dominion and glory and kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. And so we're speaking of this human yet divine figure who receives glory and kingdom, power, and dominion over all peoples and all nations. This is a figure of what we would refer to, borrowing the language found in the book of Revelation, this is speaking of the king of kings the king of the world, the king of the universe, that all people's nations and languages should serve him. Now, remember this as we go back to the text, because the text in Matthew 25 speaks of the Son of Man who is king and who is judge over all nations, that all people's nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. Close quote. And so that's Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 through 14. Now, going back to the gospel, Jesus declares, when the Son of Man, referring to himself, comes in his glory. That's a callback, as you can see, to Daniel chapter 7. When the Son of Man appears before the Ancient of Days in glory to receive dominion and power, When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. And so here, verse 31 establishes, once again, Jesus refers to himself as the Son of Man, this messianic figure who sits on his glorious throne. It refers to his kingship. And we know that his kingship is kingship over all nations, all peoples, all tribes. His kingship is over all of creation. In verse 32, we pick up, it says, Before him will be gathered all the nations. In the original Greek, pantata ethne. Ethne, it's where we get the English term ethnicity. All of the nations will be gathered before him. Now, we're going to come back to that in a moment because that detail is quite important. Jesus is sitting on the throne, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the Son of man. And he comes to pass judgment, to judge all the nations. Pantata ethne. This is an important detail. We'll come back to it in a moment. But what I want to point out is in addition to Jesus referring to himself as Son of man, who sits on the throne, therefore he is King of kings. In addition to that, we have another image, messianic image, which is that of shepherd. It says here, before him will be gathered all the nations and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And so here we have an additional title and image 
referring to Jesus as shepherd. And we know in John chapter 10, Jesus identifies himself as the good shepherd. Now, each of these messianic titles is rooted in the Old Testament scriptures. As I noted a moment ago, Son of Man, Daniel chapter 7, the image of the Messiah as king, well, that's rooted in the Davidic dynasty, the Davidic kingdom. There was a promise made to David that his son, the son of David, now immediately that would be Solomon, who would assume the throne, who would succeed his father on the throne. But God promises to David that his kingdom would be an everlasting kingdom. And that prophecy is fulfilled with the coming of Christ, who is the son of David. He is a new Solomon. Furthermore, we have this image of Jesus as shepherd, the good shepherd. That also has its grounding, its rootedness, its foundation in the Old Testament scriptures. And one passage in particular comes to mind. If you turn with me to Ezekiel chapter 34, and we've touched upon this in previous episodes, here in chapter 34, God is railing against, he's railing against the priests, the priests of this particular era, this particular time in the history of Israel. He's railing against them because they have been derelict in their sacred duty to keep the faith, to maintain the faith, to teach the faith, to pass on the faith, to lead the people in the ways of the Lord. And because of their wickedness, because of the apostasy of these priests, God passes judgment on them. Now, I don't have time to read the entirety of this passage. I'd encourage you because today's first reading is actually taken from Ezekiel chapter 34, but not in its entirety. It omits the first 10 verses. And those verses are sobering verses. Our Lord rails against these wicked priests. So please take the time maybe to pause this video, this recording, and to read those first 10 verses. They are prelude to what God says to his people as recorded here in our first reading, Ezekiel chapter 34, verses 11 through 12, 15 through 17. Verse 11 states, and I quote, For thus says the Lord God, Behold, I, I myself will search for my sheep and will seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out his flock when some of his sheep have been scattered abroad, so will I seek out my sheep, and I will rescue them from all places where they have been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. Jumping to verse 15, I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep. Let's stop there. What is God saying here? After he rails against wicked priests, who have committed apostasy, who have broken their faith, their vows, their commitment to the Lord, and have led the people astray into idolatry and all other kinds of, of sinful debauchery. God not only rails against them and passes judgment on them, but he declares here, beginning in verse 11, he's declaring that he himself will be the shepherd of his people. God assumes the responsibility and the role as shepherd. Now, this is important, my friends, because we find the fulfillment of this promise in the person of Jesus, who is God made man, who is God incarnate, who declares himself, as I mentioned a moment ago in John chapter 10, he declares himself to be the what? The good shepherd. So it says here in verse 15, I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep and I will make them lie down, says the Lord God. That's a call back to Psalm 23, which, no coincidence here, happens to be our responsorial psalm. But more on that momentarily. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep, and I will make them lie down, says the Lord God. Verse 16, I will seek the lost, and I will bring back the strayed, and I will bind up the crippled, and I will strengthen the weak. And the fat and the strong I will watch over. I will feed them in justice. Verse 17, As for you, my flock, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I judge between sheep and sheep, 
rams and he goats. Close quote. Now that verse is critical. That verse is critical. Why? Because it shows us that Jesus, in delivering this parable to his disciples, he's drawing from passages like Ezekiel chapter 34. He's borrowing the same language employed here. He is identifying himself as the good shepherd. God is shepherd of his people. And God will pass judgment. Note this. He will separate, it says here in verse 17 of Ezekiel 34, As for you, my flock, thus says the Lord God, behold, I judge between sheep and sheep, rams and he goats. And so Jesus in our gospel, Jesus is borrowing from Ezekiel 34 this language, this imagery. He is the good shepherd who separates the sheep from the goats. This is important, my friends, because this image of Jesus as the good shepherd is furthermore complemented, as is stated here in verse 17. Not only is God going to be the shepherd of his people, but he's also going to act as judge. And we find in this parable in Matthew 25, this image of, of Jesus as son of man, as king of kings, as good shepherd, and as judge. He will judge. He will separate the sheep from the goats. Now, this image, the sheep, the goats, they represent all the nations in the context of Matthew chapter 25. They represent the righteous and the unrighteous. They represent the holy and the wicked who will stand before the just judge, who will separate the sheep from the goats. Now, the image of sheep, obviously sheep, they represent those who are docile to the Lord. They are the ones who recognize the voice of the shepherd, who leads them to lie down in green pastures, who leads them beside still waters. The goats, on the other hand, represent the unrighteous. They, goats, are synonymous with stubbornness. They are difficult animals, not like the sheep who are much more docile and obedient the goats, they represent those who have resisted the commands of the Lord, those who have resisted the commands of the shepherd, the will of the shepherd, who have refused to be guided. They have chosen to go their own way. And so you have the image of the sheep, you have the image of the goats. Now, one more thing I want to add here, and this is another important point, because here in this one parable, we have so many messianic titles that are being employed. You have, once again, son of man, you have king of kings, you have the image of the good shepherd, you have the image of the just judge. But also note, going back to Ezekiel chapter 34, if you fast forward to verses 23 and 24, I want to note this detail. It doesn't appear in our first reading for this Sunday, but it represents and it contains, I think, a very salient point. It says in verse 23, and I will set up over them one shepherd. Now, hold on a second. Didn't God just a moment ago declare himself to be the one shepherd of his people? So what is he saying now? Is he contradicting himself? This is just a few verses later from the verse that we ended on, verse 17. It says, again, verse 23, And I will set up over them, over God's people, one shepherd, my servant David, and he shall feed them. He shall feed them and be their shepherd. Let's stop there for a second. So what's going on here? Once again, is, is God contradicting himself? He just said that he was going to himself be the shepherd of his people. But now, in the same breath, he is declaring that he will set up, he will appoint over them one shepherd, my servant David. But wait a minute. This book, the book of the prophet Ezekiel, is written some 500 years after the time of David. So clearly he doesn't mean David the king, as in King David of old. No, because he's long dead. This is a reference to a son of David. It doesn't refer to Solomon because Solomon too has been long dead by this time. It refers to, it points forward to the ultimate son of David, the new Solomon, Jesus Christ, who is true God and true man. And so, no, God is not contradicting himself. God is declaring, I myself will be their shepherd. 
And I myself will lead and guide them and rule over them and make them to lie down in green pastures, lead them beside still waters. I will nourish them and care for them and protect them. I will appoint over my people one shepherd. He refers to my servant David. Jesus, the Messiah, the son of the father, is the son of David. He is the new Solomon. And so I share that with you because I want to underscore the fact that Jesus is the fulfillment of these Old Testament prophecies that promised that he would be shepherd over his people. And he fulfilled that promise by sending his only begotten son, the son of David. He appointed the son of David to be shepherd over his flock, his people. Now, with that said, why don't we return to our gospel passage. Verse 32, before him will be gathered all the nations, all the nations. I mentioned earlier that that detail is is significant because he is speaking of all the nations of the world, not just the nation of Israel, not just God's chosen people, but all of the nations. And the criteria, as you read the remainder of the text, the criteria that he establishes for those who will gain entrance into the kingdom of heaven or those who will be rejected and shut out of the kingdom, the standard that he upholds is what we would refer to as the corporal works of mercy. And there are seven corporal works of mercy. Six of them are alluded to here in this passage. We are to give food to the hungry. We are to give drink to the thirsty, clothe the naked. We are to welcome the stranger, care for the sick, visit the imprisoned, and bury the dead. This is what Jesus lays out. And it raises a very interesting question. What about the spiritual works of mercy? When we have the corporal works of mercy, and we know that they're rooted and grounded in the scriptures and in the teaching of Christ, but we also have the spiritual works of mercy. Christ demands more of us than just feeding the hungry and caring for those who are poor and who are needy. I mean, just go back to the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapters 5 through 7. Jesus clearly demands of his disciples so much more what St. John Paul II refers to as the high standard of ordinary Christian living. It is not enough for us to merely feed the hungry and clothe the naked and to welcome the stranger. See, these are principles, moral principles and commandments that we find in the Old Covenant. I mean, you look at passages like, I'll give you an example, passages like Isaiah chapter 58. In Isaiah 58, the prophet writes as follows, quote, beginning in verse 6, Is not this the fast that I choose? To loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the thongs of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke? What he's speaking about here is true righteousness. What it means to truly pray and fast. Because if we pray and we fast, but yet we don't do the corporal works of mercy, then what good? What good can truly come out of? What is going to be the fruit of our prayer and our fasting if we do not engage in good works? That's the thesis here. So he goes on in verse 7. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring homeless poor into your house when you see the naked to cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh? I mean, what he's pointing to here are the corporal works of mercy. He goes on, verse 8, Then shall your light break forth like the dawn, and your healing shall spring up speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry, and he will say, Here I am. Close quote. So what is the prophet pointing to here? The corporal works of mercy. They are critical. We can't just merely pray and fast, keep to ourselves, and not love our neighbor, not engage in the corporal works of mercy, and believe ourselves to be righteous. And so Jesus here, yes, he's pointing to the corporal works of mercy that are critical. And there certainly is a biblical basis for this, both in the Old Testament as well as in the New Testament. I think of passages like 1 John chapter 4, verses 20 and 21. St. John writes, quote, if anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. Verse 21, and this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God should love his brother also. Close quote. 
And so it points back to, again, this fundamental principle. How can we say that we love God whom we have not seen and yet hate our brother whom we have seen? How is that possible? We cannot say we love God yet hate or neglect our neighbor because he is created in the image and likeness of God. That is what John is pointing to, that fundamental principle, the imago dei. Each of us bears the image of God created in his image and likeness. And because of that, we are to love one another. No, as Isaiah pointed out, it's not enough for us to pray and to fast, but we, as Jesus teaches in the Sermon on the Mount, we also are called to give alms to the poor, to care for the poor. And this is what he is upholding here. This is what he is emphasizing in this passage regarding the final judgment. There's another passage that comes to mind as it applies to this fundamental principle of the Christian life. Go with me to James chapter 2, verses 14 through 17, which states, and I quote, What does it profit, my brethren, if a man says he has faith, but he has not works? Can his faith save him? If a brother or sister is ill-clad and in lack of daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what does it profit? So faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. Close quote. So faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. Now this, this destroys the classic Protestant argument that we're saved by faith alone. One of the battle cries of Martin Luther as he led the rebellion, as he led souls out of the Catholic Church, as he revolted against Holy Mother Church, one of the fundamental tenets and pillars of the Protestant revolt is grounded in this false premise, this faulty thesis, this erroneous notion that we're saved by faith alone. Sola fide in the Latin. But you can't read the Bible. You can't read the scriptures. There's no way to reconcile that thesis with the Gospels, with the teaching of Christ, with passages like James chapter 2, which is precisely why, parenthetically speaking, Martin Luther sought to destroy, to excise the letter of James from the canon of the New Testament scriptures. He wanted to throw little Jimmy, as he referred to the letter of James, into the fire because it did not comport with his theology, which he held up as the standard to which scripture had to conform. But again, that's for another lesson at another time. But back to the topic at hand, Jesus is pointing to, as he delivers this final parable, the importance of works that complement our faith, that flow from our faith. That is not enough to say, I believe. Faith alone cannot save us. This is the thesis here that is put forth by James. What does it profit my brethren if a man says that he has faith, he believes, but has not works. Can his faith save him? And clearly the answer is no. We're not saved by faith alone. No, we believe that we are saved by grace, by the grace of Christ. Christ saves us through his amazing grace, through faith, working in love. We're saved by grace through faith, working in love, because faith alone cannot save us. But faith working in love, animated by love, by caritas. This goes back to something I pointed out in our last episode. If you go with me to the gospel according to St. John, John 13, verses 34 and 35, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Close quote. So it is love that animates us. This new commandment Jesus gives to his disciples. What is their mission? Their mission is to love. And here in today's gospel parable, Jesus is underscoring, he's highlighting the importance of works. That our works of charity flow from what? They flow from our faith. We are saved by grace through faith, working in love. And because we believe in God, and because we wish to be obedient to God's teachings and commands, he commands us to love one another as he has loved us. 
And so we put our faith into action by loving our neighbor, by loving especially those who are most in need, those who are most vulnerable, the least of my brethren, Jesus declares. When you cared for, when you fed, when you clothed, when you visited, when you welcomed, when you cared for those least of my brothers and sisters, you cared for me, you fed me, you clothed me, you welcomed me. That points to, my friends, another fundamental teaching that is found in the gospel. If you turn with me to passages like Matthew chapter 10, Matthew 10, beginning in verse 40, Jesus declares to his disciples, he who receives you receives me. And the Greek term there for sent is apostello, is where we get the English word apostle. You see, Jesus is going to send forth his disciples as apostles, apostolos, He's going to send them forth with his authority and to speak and to preach and to teach and to act in his name. He declares to them, he who receives you receives me. And he who receives me receives the one who sent me, namely the Father. And so the apostles, they represent Christ. To receive the apostles is tantamount to receiving Christ. To receive the teaching of the apostles is to receive the teaching of Christ. This is a fundamental principle laid out by our blessed Lord. There's something akin to that in, in Jewish culture and tradition known as the Shalia. The Shalia, akin to an apostle. The Shalia was the representative, the delegate, the ambassador, the representative of, say, for example, the king. The king would send forth his Shalia to represent him before, say, another leader bearing a message from the king. And the way that that Shalia was treated, it was tantamount to treating the king in the same way. So if the message of the Shalia was received with gratitude, with enthusiasm, with respect, well, one was showing respect and enthusiasm and courtesy to the king. If one mistreated the Shalia, it was akin to mistreating and disrespecting the king. You get what I'm saying here? So Jesus impresses upon his disciples. He who receives you receives me. And he who receives me receives the one who sent me. He goes on in this very passage, beginning of verse 41, he who receives a prophet because he is a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he who receives a righteous man because he is a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. Verse 42, and whoever gives to one of these little ones, it's akin to the least of my brethren, and whoever gives to one of these little ones even a cup of cold water because he is a disciple, truly I say to you, he shall not lose his reward. Close quote. So Jesus here speaking about those who receive his followers, his disciples, they will receive a reward. Those who receive with enthusiasm, those who show appreciation and treat his emissaries with charity, they are going to receive their just recompense because they are receiving Christ himself by receiving his representatives. So that is the principle at play when you consider the words of today's gospel parable. He declares to them, come, O blessed of my father. This is verse 34. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Close quote. This is the same principle being made manifest through this parable. Jesus is found not only in the disciples, not only in the apostles, not only in the ministers and the leaders of the church, but, but Jesus is also especially present in the poor, in the needy, in those who are most vulnerable, in the downtrodden, whom I like to call the least, the last, and the lost. Jesus is found in the least, the last, and the lost. He is found in those most vulnerable peoples, He's found in the poor. And if you read the scriptures, you know that God has a special place in his sacred heart for the poor. The Lord, as the psalmist declares, hears the cry of the poor. And here Jesus is identifying 
himself with those most vulnerable. If you feed the hungry, you're feeding Christ. If you're clothing the naked, you're clothing Christ. If you're caring for the sick, you're caring for Christ. If you visit those who are imprisoned, you're visiting Christ, and so forth and so on. By performing these works of mercy, these corporal works of mercy, we are ministering to Christ himself, who is found in the poor. This is the principle laid out by our blessed Lord. And it really should be of no surprise. I mean, it's interesting here, the response of the righteous to the words of the Lord. It says in verse 37, Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see thee hungry and feed thee, or thirsty and give thee drink? And when did we see thee a stranger and welcome thee, or naked and clothe thee? And when did we see thee sick or in prison and visit thee? Verse 40, And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Close quote. Now, one of the things that has always puzzled me about this passage, every time I read it, it provokes in me the following question. Why is it that the righteous respond the way they do in this parable? In other words, why were they surprised to find out that when they fed the hungry, they were feeding Christ? That when they clothed the naked, they were clothing Christ. When they were caring for the sick, they were caring for Christ. When they were visiting the imprisoned, they were visiting Christ. Why are they surprised to hear this? Why is this a revelation to them? Have you ever wondered that? Why are they surprised? Those who follow Jesus, if you read the Gospels, if you read the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus lays out the core of his preaching, the core of his message. And you can't read the Sermon on the Mount and not walk away without a clear impression that Jesus was calling us to something lofty, to this high standard of ordinary Christian living. Because he calls us to be nothing less than perfect, as the Heavenly Father is perfect. To be merciful as God is merciful. Not to merely love those who love us in return, but to love even our enemies. I mean, Jesus, you can't read the Sermon on the Mount and not walk away dazed because of the implications of his teaching. He holds us to such a high standard. Now, as I've mentioned repeatedly, Jesus would not call us to something impossible were he not willing and able to furnish us with the grace that would enable us to reach the heights of holiness, to reach that high standard. It is Christ who empowers us. But back to the question at hand, why are they surprised? They shouldn't be surprised if they are true and knowledgeable Christians, intentional disciples. Because to be a Christian is to know (laughs) that Christ is present, most especially in the poor. Everyone is created in the image and likeness of God. We know that. And as Christians, we uphold that fundamental truth of the dignity of the human person created in the imago dei. Christ furthermore impresses upon his followers that he is to be found especially in the poor, in the needy, in the downtrodden. So why are they surprised? Now, I'm not going to pretend to reconcile this in this episode. This is a very, very important question. There are many who have posited theories that this certainly is a reminder to his disciples that they are to have a preferential option for the poor, that they are to, in a special way, care for the needs of the poor and the most vulnerable. In doing so, they care for Christ, who's to be found in the poor. In addition to this, there are many commentators who suggests that there is perhaps a deeper level and layer of meaning here as one considers some of these curious elements in Jesus' parable of the separation of the sheep and the goats. One such commentator, it was interesting, as I was reading Bishop Daniel Mugenborg's book, he has a series of reflections that are compiled into three volumes. The series is Come, Follow Me, Discipleship Reflections on the Sunday Gospel Readings. And for this Sunday's entry, he makes the following observation, and I thought it would be worthwhile sharing this with you. He writes the following, and this is on page 332 of this work. Bishop states, and I quote, There is a deeper level on which we can read this parable so as to be challenged in an even far greater way. We usually read this parable as an instruction to Christian disciples 
And so we perceive the challenge to be that of practical charity. However, it is important to note that this parable is significantly different from the previous teachings on divine judgment, which we have studied for the past three weeks. In each of the previous parables, judgment took place upon someone who was already an insider and associated with the house of God as a steward, maiden, or servant. In this final parable, the subjects of judgment are, quote, nations, unquote. The term, quote, nations, unquote, referred to the Gentiles and those who were not already associated with the house of God. Thus, this parable most probably deals with the judgment of those who are non-believers in Jesus, those who do not know God. That insight gives this parable a new twist. You see, disciples should have already known that Jesus is present in others because our Lord instructed them as such in Matthew 10, verse 40, when he said, whoever receives you, receives me. This teaching about the hidden presence of Christ in the least of his brothers and sisters should not be anything new at all to someone who has read Matthew's gospel or who has been following Jesus. Jesus presumes that his disciples will serve him in one another. This parable is most probably intended as the basis for divine judgment for those who are not his disciples. That insight has serious implications for us as his followers. It means that disciples are held to a much higher standard than non-disciples. It is not enough for us to aspire to the lowest possible standard. Rather, we must strive to fulfill the Father's will as revealed in Jesus and taught in the Gospels. If we are challenged by the commission to do works of mercy for the less fortunate, we have not been listening very well to the Lord's teaching for this past year. Jesus holds disciples to a much higher standard than the nations in this passage. He expects us to not only do good for the less fortunate, but to even love our enemies. Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 to 48. He expects us to not only clothe the naked, but to give our cloak to the oppressor. Matthew chapter 5, verses 38 through 42. He expects us to practice a chastity of heart. Matthew 5, verses 27 through 30. Control of anger. Matthew 5, verses 21 through 26 and desire for perfection, Matthew 5, verses 17 through 20, that goes beyond the ordinary. Simply put, the Lord expects more of us than just works of charity. We cannot appeal to the standard of a non-believer and exempt ourselves from the more demanding challenges of discipleship. Close quote. And that is, again, from Come, Follow Me, Discipleship Reflections on the Sunday Gospel Readings, written by Bishop Daniel H. Mugenborg. An excellent series, by the way. And I think that the thesis, and again, this is but a thesis, a theory, one way of, of approaching and interpreting this passage, I think that it is quite interesting. I think it provokes us, I think, to a deeper introspection as we wrestle with the elements of this very curious and seemingly paradoxical parable. Nevertheless, getting back to the text, Jesus is making it abundantly clear that we are to care for those who are most vulnerable, engage in these works of charity. And with respect to those who are placed at his left hand, namely the goats, the unrighteous, he is going to declare to them that when they failed to feed the hungry and to clothe the naked, they failed to do so to him. We refer to that as sins of omission. There are sins of commission, sins that we commit through our own volition, and there are sins of omission. And the sins of omission refer to the failure to do the good that we're commanded to do. And once again, the biblical basis for this, sins of omission, can be found in the letter according to St. James. In his epistle, in chapter 4, and verse 17, we read as follows, and I quote, Whoever knows what is right to do and fails to do it, for him it is 
sin. I'm going to say it again. Verse 17, whoever knows what is right to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. This is what we refer to as the sin or the sins of omission. And it's quite interesting that Jesus in this parable, he does not point to sins of commission, but rather sins of omission. The good that we know we are to do, that we're commanded to do, yet we fail to do. Those sins of omission, our Lord is not only going to hold us responsible for the things that we do, but also the things that we fail to do. And that is a sobering truth, my friends. I mean, we tend to, just generally speaking, we tend to focus on sins of commission. But as we examine our consciences, as we prepare ourselves as Catholics to frequent the sacrament of penance, do we give sufficient reflection to the sins of omission, the failure on our part to do the things that we know we're commanded to do? I think, generally speaking now, that we tend to gloss over the sins of omission and we tend to emphasize the sins of commission. And I think today's gospel, it exhorts us. It is a wake-up call for us to, to be mindful of as we examine our consciences, as we seek to grow in our relationship with the Lord, that we must pay close attention to the sins of omission, the good things that we're commanded to do, that no doubt are hard things that we're commanded to do. When we fail to do these things, as in the case of today's gospel, we fail to to give food to the hungry, to clothe the naked, to house the homeless, to visit the imprisoned, to care for the sick, to bury the dead. When we fail to do these things, we're committing grave sins. And so, my friends, I know that there's a lot. <laughs> and we're just skimming the surface here. There's so much more that could be said regarding this gospel. But the fundamental message here is a sobering one because he's calling us to account for our stewardship, going back to last week's parable of, of the gifts that we have received and have we employed those gifts in the service of others, especially the poor? Have we used responsibly and dutifully and charitably all that God has given to us and have we applied these blessings in order to bless others? There's a lot for us to ponder here, my friends, and I hope that this reflection has, has served to to prompt you to a deeper examination of these scriptures. They are very, very sobering. What I'd like to do is I'd like to close by citing our responsorial psalm, which I mentioned is taken from Psalm 23, the most iconic, the most famous of all the psalms in the Psalter. And it is a psalm that extols the Lord as our shepherd. Psalm 23, beginning of verse 1, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. For thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Close quote. Now, much can be said here regarding this psalm. But once again, this psalm is underscoring the fact that the Lord truly is our shepherd. God himself, as we noted in Ezekiel 34, declares himself to be our true shepherd, our one shepherd. Jesus is the good shepherd, and he has come to shepherd us. But he sends forth emissaries. He sends forth his apostles to the four corners of the earth to make disciples of all nations, to be his witnesses, to minister to the least, the last, and the lost, to minister to the poor in a particular way. And so when we consider today's gospel parable. Let us be mindful of the fact that, yes, Jesus is our shepherd, but he has chosen each and every one of us and appointed us to be his hands and his feet, as St. Teresa of Avila teaches us. We are his ambassadors, and we are to go forth in the name of Jesus and to bring Jesus to all those in need. That is an awesome responsibility, my friends. Our Lord indeed shepherds us, 
but, but he uses his chosen instruments. He uses the bishops, the successors of the apostles, and their collaborators, the priests, and the religious. He uses even us lay faithful to be his hands and his feet, to be his ambassadors, to reach out to a world with the good news of salvation. And so we are duty bound, my friends, to fulfill this great commission, which involves not merely the announcement of the gospel of salvation, that is fundamental and primary, but it also includes care for the poor. It also includes these corporal works of mercy. Now, with that said, my friends, I'd like to bring this episode to a close by citing a few brief but relevant passages from the Catechism of the Catholic Church. And I want to begin by citing paragraph 544, which states as follows, and I quote, The kingdom belongs to the poor and lowly, which means those who have accepted it with humble hearts. Jesus is sent to preach good news to the poor. He declares them blessed, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. To them, the little ones, the Father is pleased to reveal what remains hidden from the wise and the learned. Jesus shares the life of the poor, from the cradle to the cross. He experiences hunger, thirst, and privation. Jesus, and I want to underscore this, this final sentence in this paragraph, Jesus identifies himself with the poor of every kind and makes active love toward them the condition for entering his kingdom. I'm going to say that again. Jesus identifies himself with the poor of every kind and makes active love toward them the condition for entering his kingdom. Close quote. The next paragraph I want to share with you is paragraph 1033, which states the following, and I quote, We cannot be united with God unless we freely choose to love him. But we cannot love God if we sin gravely against him, against our neighbor, or against ourselves. Our Lord warns us that we shall be separated from him if we fail to meet the serious needs of the poor and the little ones who are his brethren. I'm going to say that last part again. Our Lord warns us that we shall be separated from him if we fail to meet the serious needs of the poor and the little ones who are his brethren. Close quote. It's paragraph 1033. Turn with me finally to paragraph 1039, which states, and I quote, in the presence of Christ, who is truth itself, the truth of each man's relationship with God will be laid bare. The last judgment will reveal, even to its furthest consequences, the good each person has done or failed to do during his earthly life. And then quoting a sermon of St. Augustine, the Catechism concludes, and I quote, All that the wicked do is recorded, and they do not know. When, quote, our God comes, he does not keep silence, unquote. He will turn towards those at his left hand, quote, I placed my poor little ones on earth for you. I, as their head, was seated in heaven at the right hand of my father. But on earth, my members were suffering. My members on earth were in need. If you gave anything to my members, what you gave would reach their head. Would that you had known that my little ones were in need when I placed them on earth for you and appointed them your stewards to bring your good works into my treasury. But you have placed nothing in their hands. Therefore, you have found nothing in my presence. Close quote. What a powerful and sobering passage from the Catechism. St. Augustine underscoring the teaching of our blessed Lord here in this parable found in Matthew chapter 25. There's much for us to consider, my friends, much for us to reflect upon as we prepare to celebrate this great solemnity of our Lord Jesus Christ, King of the universe. We're going to celebrate the reality of this Son of Man, this King of Kings, this Lord of Lords, our true and good shepherd, the just judge. We each will stand before the tribunal of the Lord. And we will have to render an account of our stewardship. Let us be mindful, my friends, as followers of Jesus, that we have a sacred duty 
to reach out to the poor and the vulnerable and the needy in a particular way, in a special way, because Christ is to be found in the most vulnerable. And we need to recognize, as St. Augustine posits here in this sermon excerpt, that the most vulnerable, the least, the last, and the lost, the downtrodden, the poor. Remember, God hears the cry of the poor. And it is precisely the poor who will present before the Lord our good deeds, our works of charity. They will be ambassadors. They will furnish witness to the Lord of each and every of our good deeds. They will be called as witnesses. And so that begs the question, my friends, how have we treated the poor? How have we treated those most vulnerable? I pray that as we prepare for this sacred liturgy, that we would make an examination of conscience, that we would ask ourselves these fundamental questions, and that we would make a concerted effort to reorient our lives and our priorities in such a way as to be mindful of the poor in a deliberate and intentional way, and to marshal our resources and our energies to be able to serve the poor in, once again, a deliberate and intentional way, not merely when we bump into them on the streets and in our travels, in a happenstance type of a way, but to be intentional about it, to support those efforts and initiatives, to be deliberate in reaching out intentionally to those who are most vulnerable in order to assist them, to assist them in their plight. In doing so, we minister to Christ himself who is the head. Oh, my friends, this brings our episode to a close. As always, my fervent hope and prayers that this podcast series has been and continues to be source of inspiration and encouragement to you. If it has been, praise God for that. I encourage you, if this podcast has been a blessing for you, please be sure, if you're watching it via our YouTube channel, be sure to like and subscribe. By liking and subscribing, you indicate to YouTube that there's value in this content and they're more apt to push these videos out to more and more viewers. And that's the whole point of this channel. It exists to make Christ known. If you'd like to take a step further, if this podcast series has been a blessing to you, please consider partnering with me in making it a blessing for others. You can do so by becoming a patron, a co-producer of this podcast. To do so, visit patreon.com forward slash Hector Molina. On that page, you'll see a number of different levels of patronage. And for as little as the cost of a cup of coffee a month, you can become a patron. And let me assure you that every little bit counts as it takes resources to continue to produce these high quality digital resources. And so I exhort you, please consider partnering with me in this endeavor. Every little bit counts. And speaking of patrons, let me just express my heartfelt gratitude, as is my custom, to my small community of patrons for their continued support and encouragement and partnership. I wouldn't be able to do this without you. So may God continue to richly bless you. If you're more inclined to give a one-time or an occasional gift, you can do so by visiting buymeacoffee.com forward slash Hector Molina. Buy Me A Coffee is a platform devoted to supporting the work of content creators. With each cup of coffee bought, you express your appreciation of and support for this podcast. So please consider showing us some love by visiting buymeacoffee.com forward slash Hector Molina. Well, my friends, until we gather again next week to consider the readings for the first Sunday of Advent, my fervent prayer continues to be for you in the words of the Apostle Paul. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 16, may the word of God continue to richly dwell in you. Que viva Cristo Rey.